Good evening. I'm Lee Patterson, Richland Library Social Work Manager, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you to this Teletown Hall meeting. Thank you for joining us. Recent reports show that more than 130,000 children are in kinship care across South Carolina, and oftentimes caregivers have a pre-existing relationship. They can be grandparents, aunts, uncles, godparents, neighbors, family friends, educators, mentors, and others. Richland Library wants to connect you to these caregivers with important information and resources available in our community. We are thankful to have representatives from Edward Children's Home, South Carolina Legal Services, the South Carolina Department of Education, and the South Carolina Department of Social Services. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. I will turn over tonight's call to Tamara King, Richland Library's Community Relations Director. She will be moderating our panel discussion. Tamara? Thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Over the next hour, we will address the rights and responsibilities of caregivers, as well as how to navigate medical emergencies, school enrollment, custody, trauma, and much more. If you would like to ask a question at any time during this meeting, press zero on your telephone keypad, and you'll be connected to a staff member who will note your name and question, and then place you in a queue to ask that question live. But joining us on tonight's call, we have a great lineup for you tonight. We have Frances Pope Hewitt. She's a direct, senior director at the Institute for Child and Family Wellbeing at Epworth Children's Home. Melinda Taylor, family law unit head, and Jennifer Rainville, lead education law attorney at South Carolina Legal Services. Scott Winburn, attorney with the South Carolina Department of Education. And Charlita Woodall, statewide kinship care manager with the South Carolina Department of Social Services. So we have a great lineup tonight, and in addition to that, to help answer some of your additional additional questions. You will also hear from Ebony Young, a local entrepreneur and education specialist, and Josh Gupta Kagan, a University of South Carolina faculty member. So as you can see from our lineup, we have a lot to get into. So let's get things underway. The spread of COVID-19 is causing a number of major changes in our community, including face-to-face -face interactions and the way in which organizations provide public-facing services. We want to provide a strong base for caregivers, making sure you don't feel overwhelmed and isolated during this time. Tonight is your opportunity to ask and learn questions, uh, learn some things, and get answers from leading experts. Starting us off is Frances Pope Hewitt with Epworth Children's Home. Since 1896, her organization has been helping children ages 12, to 12 and up from severely stressed family systems by providing education, counseling, medical care, and spiritual enrichment. Thank you so much, Ms. Pope Hewitt, for being on the call. Thank you for having me. Great. Right. Right. You know, this is, a, this is a really stressful time for a mm -hmm. lot of people. So I can imagine it's even more stressful if you're having to regulate emotions of children during this pandemic. Are there certain things that parents should be looking at or caregivers should be paying attention to during this time? And, and when should they start looking to get some help with those with their, the people that are there in their charge? Oh, those are great questions. First, it's always a good reminder to remember that we're not born with knowing how to emotionally regulate. So the biggest thing we can do as adults is model healthy emotions to the children in our care. Since children are much more vulnerable to the emotional impact of traumatic events that disrupt daily lives, such as the worldwide pandemic we're in right now, children benefit from consistency. So here are some examples that we can do to provide that consistency. One, we can always remember to reassure them that they are safe. Two, we want to limit their exposure to the news so they are not constantly inundated with negative information. We want to help them create routines so they always know what to expect. We want to teach them coping skills such as counting to 10, taking a deep breath, but the key with coping skills is when we're teaching them, it's important not to do it in response to the emotion itself, but to practice it before the emotion arises. Anger and frustration can often be the hardest to deal with as a caregiver. For example, with excessive anger, we can work on teaching the children to channel their anger into an outlet, such as doing jumping jacks or playing outside. It's just important to allow them the time and space they need to feel their feelings, just as important as it is for us not to judge them, you know, for having their feelings because they're still learning how to appropriately express them. 
And five, we can always redirect attention. And this is a great technique to use when they're becoming overwhelmed with their feelings. So asking them to play a game with you is one way to help them distract from whatever the overwhelming emotion may be. I like so what kind of games what kind of games are you thinking that parents can play and uh or caregivers can play with their with their children and what how do you find resources you know what's age appropriate you know, it all depends on the child. And sometimes um, getting them to play Hungry, Hungry Hippo, you know, if they're um, a younger child or if they're a little older, getting them um, involved in something that may require a little bit more um, memory, such as playing the game memory, getting them with Monopoly, doing board games, or even sometimes just going outside and kicking a ball, right? Because what we want to do is get them out of that intense emotion that they're locked in. So find whatever their favorite game is. Um, it can be, you know, play and chase, play and tag. It's all about just getting back into movement. That's a great point. Um, and, you know, I think this is a tough time for parents. Uh, how are, are and caregivers, how do caregivers not let some of the stresses they're feeling uh, kind of bleed over into the child's daily experience? Because a lot of children are home, you know, school's out of session, and it could be out of session for quite a while. Um, and virtual learning puts a whole nother stress on, on families who are already feeling the challenges of this time. So how do you, as a parent or a caregiver, make sure that your emotions are in check? I think the most important thing is to always be honest with oneself, and I, that's important for me. Um, I have to practice a lot of self-care to ensure that I'm able to be present for the loved ones whom I'm responsible for. It's so difficult because especially as caregivers, we are so focused on taking care of everyone else except ourselves. But the only way that we can truly be present for another human being and attend to their needs is making sure that we're um, doing it for ourselves. So whether that's getting some exercise, taking a time out, you know, mommy needs to take a five-minute time out um, so it's not seen as a bad thing. Um, you, journaling is always a great option. Having a healthy connection of, you know, social engagement, whether it's friends, touch and base, whether it's your spiritual um, aspects. The most important thing we can do, again, is always model these behaviors. When you talk about behaviors, let's let's go back to children and certain behaviors yeah. or traumas. Is there anything yeah. that we should be looking for? Is it lack of sleep? Is it uh, maybe being a little bit more attached to you or uh, acting out? What kind of uh, things should people be looking for to say, you know what, that may be something that the kids are feeling negatively from the pandemic and everything else going on in our world right now? You know, that is a great question because a lot of people are, you know, we are experiencing new things that we haven't before. So it is important that we keep in mind that any new and challenging behaviors, they may be a natural response to stress. You know, some children may be irritable or clingy. Some may show, you know, age-inappropriate behaviors, demand extra attention. They may even, like you were saying, have difficulty with sleeping and eating. But any behavior that can't be managed by the caregiver or even be redirected or is causing, um, it's ongoing, it's, you know, continuing, it's happening day after day. I think anything like that, it would be wise to reach out to a mental health professional just to express your concerns. Hey, I'm noticing my child is starting to cry more. I can't walk out of the bedroom. I can't walk out of the room, you know, especially if they're showing those signs of separation anxiety and it's ongoing and that it's not easily um, attended or redirected. It's important just to reach out to a professional. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong per se with the child. It just um, will allow, you know, going and getting counseling will allow you all an opportunity, a safe opportunity to learn new skills and how to navigate all these unknown waters that all of us are in. Very good point. Is you know when you talk about people needing um, or finding a healthcare professional or a mental health person uh, to talk to or to get their children linked up to or whoever is in their care, uh, where do people go find those services? And we'll probably talk a little bit about that later on. But since we're on that topic, do you have any places and resources that parents can go? And well, most definitely. Feel free to give us a call because here at the F4 Center for Counseling, we do provide um, counseling for children five and up. Uh, we are available to the community, not just to um, clients of Epworth. We are here to serve the community. Please feel free to call us. And even if you're not necessarily wanting counseling but wanting resources, 
just call me directly. Um, and, of course, my office line is, of course, 803-753-7162. And I am more than willing to talk to anyone about finding the appropriate resources for, you know, for their family and for whatever they're presenting with. Can you give that contact number one more time just for people who were looking for pens and pencils <laughs> during that yeah. time? Can you share no, that with us yeah. again? Yes. So for anyone, um, those of you on the call who are interested in pursuing counseling, um, Epworth Center for Counseling, that telephone number is area code 803-667-4444. Again, 803-667-4697. But if you sometimes just want to get some resources um, available in the community and you recognize you may not need counseling, please feel free to give me a call in my office. And that number is 803-753-7162. Again, 803-753-7162. I'd be more than willing to speak with anyone and try to help guide in the right direction. Thank you, Ms. Pope Hewitt, for all of that wonderful information. For those of you just joining us, my name is Tamara King. I'm the Richmond Library Community Relations Director, and you're listening to a town hall meeting where we're having an important discussion on kinship caregiving during the COVID-19 crisis. If you would like to ask a question, press zero on your telephone keypad now, and you will be connected uh, to a, a someone who's taking the phone calls, and they will put you in a queue. Um, but next, as we take a, we're going to take a break in about another five minutes or so for questions. But next, we will hear from Melinda Taylor and Jennifer Rainville with South Carolina Legal Services. Their organization works closely with low-income residents and provides access to legal assistance. Uh, thank you, ladies, for being on the call. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Since most situations are based on informal arrangements, um, what legal rights do caregivers have and the children that they're looking after? What kind of rights do parents have? Or not parents, I'm sorry, caregivers. So caregivers uh, would normally not have very many rights until they get a formal custody order or an adoption order um, with the exception of being able to enroll the child in school and Jennifer might be able to talk about that a little bit more um, that's right there is a there's some specific situations um, which would allow a caregiver to enroll a child in school without having to get custody or an order from the court and that's called a school enrollment affidavit um, and that's something that typically they can get from the district office of the school district that they're trying to enroll the child in, or um, they could come see us at legal services, and that's something that we could help with as well. What financial options are available for caregivers? Well, I guess it depends on what they're trying to do. Um, so if they're trying to nav navigate the legal system, um, obviously there is some expense associated with that. Um, at South Carolina Legal Services, we can represent low-income um, caregivers for free if they qualify for our services, and we can assist them with getting um, custody orders or adoption decrees if that's what they desire. There's also... Um, if, if they're seeking to adopt the child, there is a subsidy through DSS. Um, it's a one-time subsidy that can help pay for some of their expenses um, associated with the legal action. You know, we, you know, you you've given us a lot of great resources, and we'll open up the phone lines in just a moment. Um, but is there anything you can offer caregivers? on where they can turn. If they have those legal questions, where can people go? Because I can imagine with these kind of informal and formal arrangements uh, when you're caring for children, uh, there is a lot of information out there, but you don't always feel connected to it or know how to get to it. So what can you share with the folks on the call today? So um, just visiting our website, um, sclegal.org. We have a lot of 
lot of information on it. Um, if they feel like they need to speak with an attorney, um, of course, they could seek the advice of a private attorney, or if they believe they may qualify for our services, they can um, call our intake line. It's one eight 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 three four six five five nine two. Um, to do an intake to be able to speak with one of our attorneys. Um, but the main thing, I think, is if they're at a, a standstill and they need some type of legal help is to speak with an attorney first. Well, we're going to give, we're going to give people an opportunity to do just that. Um, thank you, Ms. Taylor and Ms. Rainville. If someone would like to contact you directly, you've given that number, but can you give it just one more time? I like just because people are sometimes trying to look for a piece of paper or, or a pen. Uh, could you give that number one more time to contact you? Sure. It's uh, uh, it's one eight 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 three four six five five nine, and that is our intake um, line if they want to apply for our services. We're going to open the phone lines for questions. We've got a few people on waiting. Um, so right now we're going to take questions for the Epworth Children's Home and South Carolina Legal Services. The first question is from Thomasina uh, Miller. Uh, she wants to know if you're a parent with a child in kinship care, how can you take parenting classes during the pandemic? Ms. Miller, are you there? Um, yes, ma'am, I am. Please ask your question. So, if you, so I'm, I have concerns. So if you are a parent, right, and you're trying to take parenting classes and et cetera, how are you able to do that during the pandemic if we're supposed to be social distancing and you're worried about the child getting sick? Is that going to hinder you or it's, like, so confusing? Confusing. Yeah. So, hello. Yes, ma'am. I'm just trying to make all the information. Would this be a situation where DFS has removed the child from the parents' home? Say that again, ma'am. I, I just want to make sure I have the information. Is this where DSS has maybe removed the child from the parents' home and you're trying to take parenting classes to get the child returned? Is where um, they give you the option to let a family member get get the child, so that they don't have to remove them. Okay. So um, again, you'd probably want to speak to an attorney about your specific situation, where they can go into a lot more detail than what we can on this phone line, um, but. I can imagine that most of these services, and I don't know for sure because I haven't checked, um, are they are they not off, offering an online um, remote type classes at this point? Have you looked into that? Not that I'm, I know of because um, I've been trying to contact people and I haven't really got nothing, like no answers, no feedback, no nothing. And it's been going on like four months. And I've been waiting for my uh, the situation of it being like a family member, then I wouldn't have no physical contact at all. Ms. Miller, have you been in touch um, with the caseworker to see what type of solutions they may have for you, such as virtual parenting classes? Um, on, on Zoom or on the phone, just so you can, of course, continue to meet um, those requirements. Yes, I have, and I, they don't seem to have an answer. As always, they're going to contact their supervisor. Uh, when I get my lawyer to contact them, she's been trying to contact their lawyer for over three months and haven't uh -huh. received a response back yet. Um, Ms. Miller, this is Lee from the library. What I can do, I do believe Lifeline, which is based out of Charleston, is doing some classes online that are virtual that you can log on to no matter what zip code you're calling from. But I can get that, give you a call probably tomorrow just to give you some, some final details on how to get involved in those classes so you can get those classes taken care of. Okay. 
And um, this Ms. is Hill- 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 Department of Social Kinship Care Manager. Um, and I don't know how you can do this, Lee, but um, if if you can, um, well, I can give you my contact information as well. Um, just to you know, just talk offline, you know, more about you know what you might um, need support from our agency um, as well. Okay. Okay. So, so Ms. Miller, do I have my number? At the end of this call, Ms. Miller, uh, you'll hear they'll say if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can leave a voicemail. If you leave a voicemail with your information, uh, then we can share it with the people that have um, identified as being able to help you on the call. Okay, but so see, I have one more call, question. Yeah, so my phone is about to die. So is there any way I can give the information out? Um, I'll, this is Sharlita Woodall. Um, you can have my information. My contact information is um, 803. Hold on. Eight zero three. Eight nine eight. Eight nine eight. Two zero eight four. Two zero eight four. And then your name is what? Miss Woodall. How do I spell that? W O O D A L L. Thank you so much, Miss Miller, for your call. Uh, we have another person that wants to know um, how can I contact a social worker? Ms. Davis wants to know. I'm going to bring her on to the line. Ms. Davis, are you there? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I have a, a, an elderly mother that my brother that we're looking after, and uh, we were interested in getting a social worker involved uh, with her care. How do you go about doing that? Um, hi, this is Jennifer Rainville. I would recommend, have you reached out to your local area um, agency on aging? No. If you're, if you're here in Richland County, that's Central Midlands um, Council of Government. They have right, so programs. Go ahead. I'm writing it down. But okay. Central Midlands. Yep, Council of Government. And if you give me one second, I can look up their phone number for you. Okay. Um, they have a lot of really great really? programs that can help you when you're a caregiver for someone who's elderly. Okay. And their number is um, 376-5390. All right, I'm going to read that back to you. 803-376-5390. Yes, ma'am. That's correct. And that's a Central Midlands Council on of Aging government. of Government. Yeah they're, okay. yeah, they're the local area agency on aging, which is a kind of a tongue twister. But they provide a lot of services um, from respite care, meals on wheels. A lot of those programs are run from that um, that agency. So I'd recommend that you reach out to them because they have a variety of different programs that could help you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, and the next caller is Mary Walker. She wants to know what steps to take for to start the adoption process. Ms. Walker, are you there? Yes, ma'am. How are you today? I'm well. Thank you so much for calling in. Yes, ma'am. And what I was calling um, about, I, I went through legal aid services to um, uh, um, get custody. I didn't know anything about the law system um, at the time. If I did, I would have did the adoption first. But I went through, and I have full custody, and I went through one of the lawyers that they provide for me over on St. Andrews Road, somewhere out there. But I have full custody of him, but now I'm looking into how to go because the situation hasn't changed, um, try how to go about adopting him and what steps do I need to take? So the first step, of course, is to speak with a lawyer. And since you've been through legal 
services one time um, in yes, the past. You can still go back through um, South Carolina Legal Services again. Um, okay. That, what's that? I was saying, okay, I, I didn't know you could go again. <laughs> Yeah, you can reapply for our services. Um, that is something that we do do um, fairly regularly. The first step is usually that we um, apply for the DSS subsidy. Um, and then once you're approved for that, um, that helps cover your costs associated with the adoption. Yes, um, and, and And then, of course, if you qualify for our services, you get a free attorney. Um, but it is um, a a fairly long process. Um, a guardian ad litem has to be appointed for the child. Um, and of course, the uh, parents have to be served um, mm -hmm. throughout the proceedings, probably very similar to your custody case. The only, okay. the main difference is at the end, um, you would be, if, if you adopt the child, if the court approves it, um, you would become the child's parent um, and have all the same rights and responsibilities just as if the child had been born to you, and it would terminate the parental rights of the um, parents if that, has, if that has not already been done. Um, well, what, what has been done so far is um, um, I get to do the I, – I, I still can um, do for, like, make decisions for the hospital, the doctors, the schooling, and all of that, so on and so forth. I do have that. Um, and I didn't understand what you were saying that, I mean, he'd been with me since the day at the hospital. I had, I don't, I, you know, he, I haven't just not got him. Since day one, I had him. And I was trying to wait to see what the parents get themselves together, and which that didn't happen. So then went around about the age of two, I went ahead on and um, started legal aid with somebody had told me about the legal aid, and I did that. But right now, you know, I still have him. I, you know, but you were saying something that he would have to go through DSS. Did, what? No, no, ma'am. Um, so we just uh, we just usually have our clients apply for the DSS subsidy, and that's something our attorneys can help you with. Um, okay. Because because there's a there's a subsidy for DSS um, that that will where DSS will pay for up to $1,500 of the expenses mm -hmm. associated with the adoption. And that would help right. pay for the guardian ad litem, for service fees, for any other, okay. you know, the certificates have to be changed too. So any other okay. fees associated with the adoption. And that's why we get that is so that you don't have to pay that money out of your pocket. Um, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but but if, if you don't want DSS subsidy, then you could certainly move um, without it, but you would have to pay those expenses. Oh, well, they can pay it then. As long as they don't bother my baby, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's my little heartbeat. As long as they don't bother, let them do what they do because I, I remember the judge did tell me, well, when I first did it, she said, you know, she didn't know much about the system, but she told me to go. So he is on Medicaid through DSS. Um, and we did apply for the SNAP, but they told me I work in food service, and they told me I was making too much of money. So they gave me like, I think it was like fifteen dollars for six months, and then they cut cut us off. And I'm going like, this is a growing boy; he'll soon be eight on the end of this month. But you know, God has made a way that we can keep food on the table, and and um, he's well, he's well, um, you know, taken care of by the grace of God. So, and I thank God for that. That's Thank good. you, Ms. Walker. We're going, to try to, we're going to try to take one more call before we uh, get into the next uh, section. So this is Ms. Diggs. She wants to know, if school doesn't come back into session, um, will kinship caregivers be given aid or ABC voucher or something? Ms. Diggs, are you there? Yes. Wonderful. Please ask your question. Okay. Um, I have a concern about the ABC voucher that's given through um, Richland County DSS. And right now, um, my daughter's in a daycare. And I'm just trying to ascertain if school doesn't start back, are they going to extend that? And will it still be covered 
Um, right now it's been covered due to the pandemic, but I don't know when school's going to start back. So in the fall, things could change. So I just had a concern about that. So um, this is Charlita Woodall um, with DSS, the Kinship Care Manager for the agency. Um, I can find out more about that, um, but I'm believing that that would be extended um, for for you all. And if you're involved with the agency um, now, um, child care services um, are provided to those um, kinship caregivers who are involved with the agency, um, even if the pandemic wasn't going on. So. Um, you can receive um, child care for the for your um, the child that you're caring for. Thank you. Thank you again for those of you just joining us. My name is Tamara King. I'm Richland Library's Community Relations Director, and you're listening to a town hall meeting where we're oh. having an important discussion on kinship caregiving during the COVID-19 crisis. If you would like to ask a question, press zero on your telephone keypad now, and you will be connected. Those of you who are still in queue, please know we will get to you right after this last, this next segment. We're just trying to make sure that we cram a lot of information into the next 30 minutes and make sure that all of our presenters uh, are able to um, give great quality information. Next, we'll hear from Scott Winburn with the South Carolina Department of Education. The organization's mission is to provide leadership and support so all public education students graduate prepared for success. Thank you, Mr. Winburn, for being on the call. Well, thank you for having me. And I'd also like to recognize Ms. Maria Boggs is on the phone uh, as well. She's on the line. She is truly an expert. Um, she has got, got a servant's heart and is um, I work with Maria quite a bit at the department, so I'll, I'll give you that. Um, what what can I help you with? You want me to begin with answering some of these questions? Well, sure, but I think what this is a, a tough time. Schools are deciding right now what August looks like, what the new school year will look like. So what should caregivers keep in mind when it comes to school enrollment? Gosh, um, well, that's a tough question because <clears throat> in general, um, I, I would say it, it, under ideal conditions, um, there can still be issues uh, that come up with districts and enrollment of students in foster care or kinship care. Um, and I think overall, again, under ideal conditions, I think the thing to remember is if the student meets the residency requirements, it's a real hard line. We've taken, and I personally have taken a hard line position in these cases. Um, the districts have to enroll students, and obviously that's sort of an oversimplification, but I, I've even gone so far as to say it may be unprofessional conduct not to enroll them. Um, but So keep that in mind. If the student, if, if the student uh, meets the residency requirements, um, then they should be enrolled. And, I, again, that's oversimplified, but that, that really is the, the basic. Um, there are times when districts don't, well, they seem reluctant to enroll students in foster care or kinship care because they want to get their records from the, the other district or they want to make sure they know where to place the child, and sometimes that causes a delay. And while we've worked with districts in, in trying to figure out where and how best to place a student to make sure that there, is no, there are no special circumstances to consider, um, the, the bottom line is they need to be enrolled. You know, with the pandemic, um, it, it it's a it, it's a harder question because we don't know kind of what the future holds. I think districts are really trying to grapple with it. Um, state super or local superintendents are um, really trying to determine what their plan is for the districts. Um, I was with Superintendent Spearman today. Uh, and she presented to the state board, and, and she gave a nice update. And it is a, as you all know, it is a very complicated uh, issue. Accelerate Ed has has presented its report, and at the time um, schools were closed uh, earlier or late last spring, there uh, the the 
pandemic was not surging as it is now. Now the surge is pretty much in every county, whereas even when we schools were closed, we could probably pick one or two counties with uh, a surge in um, COVID cases. So it's a whole new day, and I think um, we really there's a lot that we do not know. So I think if we just focus on the fundamentals of of understanding, if you meet the residency requirements, those students who are in foster care, kinship care, are entitled to those programs, whatever they may be, whether they're going to be virtual, whether they're going to be in person, or some combination. So um, those resources are available, and those students are just as entitled to those services as any other uh, student who lives in that same district. So I hope that helps answer the at least that question. It does. And, you know, speaking of of the COVID-19 pandemic and the challenge of reaching students and finding out what the next step is going to be, how challenging has it been for you to connect and check in with those students during the pandemic and those in kinship care? Uh, how is it, has it been a, a, something that you guys have had to grapple with in the last few months? It has. Um, it, you know, there were – so much, there's so much going on at the end of last year. I think everybody was trying to sort of triage and figure out how best to deal with it. But you, you all may have read the headlines. I think some 16,000 students uh, were unaccounted for toward the end of last year. Uh, and you all know better than I do um, the truancy triggers in in the statute in state law are pretty significant. Three missed absences in a row, in a row I believe, triggers truancy proceedings. Uh, um, uh, procedures for uh, for districts, and so and again, in ordinary circumstances, when a, when a student does not show up, uh, it is not long before um, actions are taken to try to, to find that student. Um, it, it's interesting. Uh, the, the fall will be very different than the spring. I mean, these students um, that we could not locate either because of bandwidth or access to virtual learning or whatever it may be. Um, I, I would suggest to you, and don't quote me, but th there was an understanding that we're dealing with a whole new problem here in South Carolina, and, and we're not going to trigger truancy requirements. But in the fall, it'll be different. We know we've got a, we've, we've got a problem we've got to deal with, and th there will not be any excuse for uh, not being able to locate these these children. We're going to have to do a better job. Now, what that looks like, I, I don't know. Um, but suffice it to say, you know, 16,000 students out of about 700, I think it's 750,000 or so, um, it, it is maybe a relatively small percentage, but it is way too high considering all that we all undertake in order to enroll kids, get kids in class, uh, transport kids, feed kids. Uh, there's so much effort and resources devoted to it. Um, we're, we're not, you know, we're not going to give up. Um, but it, it's a long answer to say it has been tough. Uh, and in the fall, I know that that uh, districts are trying to figure out ways to ensure that these kids do not go unaccounted for, um, no matter what kind of program is going to be use uh, in, in each district, whether it be virtual or some combination. Speaking of that, how, how can caregivers support students and lower the risk of them dropping out and truancy and, and things like that? How can parents and caregivers help you in partnership to make sure that you reach these students? Well, just a couple thoughts I have. I mean, I, I am not a – I'm a lawyer for the department, and I handle – uh, kind of, this, may, this may not be my extra expertise. I'm the, the parent of, of three, two students at Satchel Ford Elementary School in Richmond One. Um, but I, I, I think what came to mind, what comes to mind, would be the IGP process. It's been my experience that each district has a um, individual graduation plan. So if you're really looking at older students um, who who um, obviously have a greater potential of dro actually dropping out of school. The, it's been my experience that school counselors uh, do a wonderful job of making sure that students are on track and just simply making, making it to that meeting, asking if a caregiver wants to go to an IGP meeting to sit down with their student and, and this counselor, that would be an excellent way 
to to ensure uh, and you get buy-in. I would imagine. Again, I'm not the expert with the student and the, and the caregiver. So those opportunities are there, and I I do not know a single school counselor who would not go out of their way, his or her way, to make that one-on-one -on -one meeting or even the phone call to make that connection with the caregiver because these people are devoted that they spend a lot of their time, especially obviously the high school level with, their, with these IGPs. I think they begin in ninth grade and go through, maybe they, I think they begin in eighth grade, and Maria may correct me on that. Um, but th this is a, a yearly meeting uh, with, to determine where the student is, what courses they need to take, what courses they want to take, what interests they have. And so um, you, you, you have resources at the school, and if they are not responsive to you, call the Department of Education, and they will, we will light a fire under them. Um, so th those, are, those are the things that come to mind. Thank you so much, Mr. Winburn. If someone wants to get in touch with you, if, if there are more questions uh, that, that we have time for today, how can people get in touch with you? Sure. Um, our website is, is pretty user friendly. Um, you can go to our website and you can look at our contacts. And you, you, we have an entire directory of every employee within the Department of Education. Uh, so you can look me up. Uh, my number is uh, 803 734 0070. Um, I've sort of told people I'm the only Winburn lawyer in the state, as far as I know. Um, <laughs> And, you know, they can just call us. And our switchboard um, operator uh, fills a lot of ground balls. And, they, and she uh, does a great job of, of directing inquiries from the public. Um, there are many, many issues that are district issues. But that doesn't mean that we can't get involved, and that doesn't mean that we can't call district folks. I tend to think that we have a good, you know, good working relationship with districts. We're not – I've never been one to – you know, the big bad Department of Education doesn't need to come in and tell them how to do it. But a lot of these, a um, lot of problems that do come across our desks are ones that we can work with districts to help resolve, and we'll do that for constituents um, uh, or anybody for that matter. Thank you. Again, for those of you just joining us, my name is Tamara King. I'm Richland Library's Community Relations Director, and you're listening to a town hall meeting where we're having an important discussion on kinship caregiving during the COVID-19 crisis. If you'd like to ask a question, press zero on your telephone keypad now, and you will be connected. And speaking of that, we're going to go to the phone line. We're going to speak to Ms. Gwynn. She has a question about schools, Mr. Winburn, so I think this will be a good question for you. Ms. Gwynn, are you there? I am, yes. Thank you. Um, ask your Ms. All right, Mr. Winburn, I have, um, I'm a great grandmother of three, and they are in my care, a six-year-old with ADHD, an eight-year-old who is autistic, and a 10-year-old who is ADHD. Virtual learning does not work. The children really don't see me as an instructor. I mean, you know, I'm a, I can't provide occupational therapy. I cannot provide speech therapy. Uh, I don't understand what is going to be done to make sure that our children are not being dumbed down in a generation. Right. Um. A great grandmother, great grandmother of three. Um, mm -hmm. Wow! I should you know. <laughs> yes. Can you tell me what district they're in? Yes, I'm from York County and Rock Hill School District. Okay. Um, and have you? So again, not not to sound like I'm punning. Has the district provided you any information about uh, this question? Actually. <sighs> It's been very vague. I did watch on Zoom last night a town hall meeting, or excuse me, not a, uh, just a Zoom meeting of the school board. Right. And uh, they've gone to an A-B schedule. And in my opinion, for what it's worth, I just don't see how that's going to be beneficial to children with learning disabilities such as these. Right. So, you know, you know, what you hear is, is probably, what you're asking probably is the most one of the more, I think, difficult aspects of um, of 
of the pandemic and how do you deal with virtual school is obviously not ideal. It's not ideal. It was not ideal for us, I'll tell you that, for my first grader and my third grader. Um, my third exactly. grader was met, and, and, and I totally can identify, at least on some level, there. Um, so it's a, it, it's, it is a difficult thing. I think the special ed services that the schools provide are excellent, and I don't think that typically, um, I, I know from experience, I mean, that it, it would not be possible for us to provide, I think, an adequate um, uh, education for our students. I mean, I'll speak for myself. My, my wife probably could. Um, so I... I, I appreciate your question. I don't have a good answer. Um, I think, though, that the folks that are studying this and trying to figure out how best to open recognize that in order to provide these special ed services that your great-grandchildren <clears throat> need, you got to go there. You need one-on-one, -on -one and, and that is that is where we're headed, in my view. Um, and so I don't believe that it will be. I think there's a general understanding and I think everyone kind of agrees that virtual just doesn't cut it across the board and it may be perfect for some but in general and then especially in the case of special ed services you got you got to get students back in the classroom and have that one-on-one -on -one, um, help um, I don't know if that answers your question I'm happy to talk to you offline I'm, I just gave you my number and if you want to call me we can talk about it um, I'll tell you Barbara Drayton in our office is really the expert in my view on special ed services, she's been doing a lot, a lot of years. Um, but it goes back to what what those those students are entitled to that those services, um, and uh, how those are provided right now during the pandemic is an open question. But um, we will get back to the to a day when we can when the, all all three of yours can be back in school. But um, I just don't know what that looks like yet. But would you call me tomorrow? Um, I'm happy to talk to you more after this. Thank you, Ms. Quinn. And we have about 15 minutes left on the call, oh. so we definitely want to bring in Ms. Charlotte, Charlita Woodall with the South Carolina Department of Social Services. Her organization's mission is to promote safety, permanency, and well-being of children and vulnerable adults. Thank you so much, Ms. Woodall, for being on the call. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be on the call tonight. So what do you... How do you know if kinship caregiving is right for your particular situation? You know, we all have, uh, we say this is something we want to do, and then sometimes we get in it and we realize it's a little bit more or not, you know, maybe not what we were thinking. So how do you know going into it that this is right for you? And I'm going to be honest. <laughs> um, so kinship care is a very unique situation. Um being involved in a kinship care situation can happen to anyone, you know, at any time. Um, the question um, is, if you've decided to become a kinship caregiver, um, it's just important, or if you're thinking about it, it's just important um, to assess and evaluate, you know, what's your current situation um, as, you know, right now. And if you have the ability to care for someone that's in addition to, um, you know, the current situation. In most instances, individuals, you know, become kinship caregivers um, without question. I mean, you know, we have grandmothers, you know, great grandmothers. They're not going to, you know, say, you know, I want my my grandchild not to be uh, with their family. So, you know, kinship caregivers automatically with no question regarding what's going on in their lives they will determine, yes, I want this child um, in my home. I want my loved one in my home. Um, so one thing that's important um, to recognize is, you know, if you've decided to care for someone, um, the most important thing that, you know, I think um, is important is to understand what your role would be as a kinship caregiver. Um, <clears throat> of course, you know, you're going to have to provide care and support um, daily, um, you know, basic needs for the child, whether that's food, clothing, um, um, you know, if the child needs medical care, and we hear medical care, um, the child has to go to school and things like that. 
Um, so, you know, it's, it's just important um, just to understand, you know, what your role would be as a kinship caregiver. And we have developed a kinship caregiver booklet that we share with our kinship caregivers um, that I would um, love to share with those who are on the call. Um, so I will definitely give my information, um, you know, after this call. Um, and, you know, kinship caregivers, um, sometimes, you know, they have minimal support because, you know, as we all know, caring for another, indiv another individual, it, you know, definitely can be costly. So services are available for kinship caregivers, but, you know, honestly, sometimes there may be some barriers because um, in some instances, sometimes kinship caregivers may not be eligible for some services. I heard someone talked about, um, you know, food stamps and um, things like that. It was based on their income. Um, so this is why, you know, I say as a whole, we all are in this together, um, you know, to work to make sure that we are providing support and services, um, you know, to our kinship family. So it's just so important um, to make sure that we're constantly bringing awareness um, to kinship caregivers so that people can understand how important not just having services that are out there or resources, but making sure that our kinship caregivers can access those services in South Carolina. Thank you for that. Please give your information out one more time, and then we're going to go to the phone lines. We have four people on the call. My job right now is to try to get all four oh, people. Oh, oh you're trying uh, to, to get the Okay, because I was like, I know we had more questions. So. <laughs> we do, we do, and it's, yeah, it's, been, it's yeah. gone by quickly. This hour has gone by very quickly. So um, my, my um, telephone number is um, 803-898. And we also have a website, an email um, address um, that you can provide uh, if you have any inquiries. It's SC Kinship Care at DSS.SC.gov. Perfect. And I'm, the next call does have to do with your department. So um, this okay. is Mr. Jones, Cole Jones, um, and he has something to ask about kinship caregiving. And uh, Mr. Jones, are you on the phone? Um, is I'm a she, but um, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. That's my fault. It, it's 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 fine. I had a two full, so I'm a little slurred a little. But my question oh. is, um, the children have been taken, and they have taken my information for me to get one of the children. I wanted mm -hmm. to know on average how long does that part take and what do I need to know as far as a person preparing to take care of an extra child? Okay. So, you know, every case is different. Um, so the case manager um, who, you know, is involved in the case, um, of course, I heard you say she reached out to you. Um, in yes. that process, we've, um, you know, have plenty awareness tools and guides to for kinship for case managers to share with our kinship caregivers um, on what kinship care looks like. You know, what would be your role, um, and that this process could be temporary, or it could move into a permanent um, situation. Um, it all depends on you know the I guess you know, what currently the, is going the situation. On. Yes, right. So, um, you know, that differs. So I can't give an exact time frame, um, but, you know, when we're involved in child welfare, you know, we want children to be reunified. Um, if, if, you know, if we have to take them out of, you know, the legal, I mean, out of the custody of the parents and place them with kinship caregivers or even place them in our legal custody, our goal is to make sure that children can be reunified back with their parents within 12 months. Like that, you know, okay. that's supposed to be our goal, reunification. Um, okay, and, and also. Sometimes it can happen sooner than that. Um, it just depends on a case-by-case -case basis. 
that's understandable. And my next question is, I'm a big uh, uh, proponent for reading. Where can I get information so I can be a little bit more informed about kinship caregiving? Because the young yeah. lady, she didn't explain it to me. I just know I don't okay. want my nephew in the system. And I was like, if I can help, I'm I'm going to step. So I'm trying to figure that out, too. Right, most definitely. So we also have a website on our dss.sc.gov website. Um, uh -huh. Kinship Care has um, a website on there, and I can share that with you. Um, you can give if you can um, send me an email um, to that what um, email address that I gave you. I can share all that information with you, as well as provide you with our Kinship Caregiver booklet. That we okay, and what's your first and last name? Charlita, S H A R L E T A. Uh huh. And my, and my last name is Woodall, W O O D A L L. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question we have will be coming from Allison Curran. She has a question about for legal services. Ms. Curran, are you there? I'm here. I actually have another question for Charlita, and I'm, I'm going to ask that question instead, if that's okay with you. Fine. Please ask your okay. question. Charlita, I have a question on um, obtaining DSS support, such as a case manager or guardian at Leadum for a kinship care case that came from Florida. Um, my nephews came to us from the state of Florida. Mm hmm and we don't have any DSS support at all. So, so can you explain that? So you're saying that you're, I mean, and I know we can talk about this offline because everything is case by case, but so your, um, the children that you're caring for came from, um, were involved with DSS in Florida? Is that right or no? Yes, they were. Yeah, they were removed from the home and we have custody, temporary custody of them. Okay, so did someone come out um, from our agency to assess your home? No, we had to fly down to Florida to get them from DSS down there. Okay, so it sounds like the court may have just, you know, provided you with custody and then they closed the case. I, I'm guessing, I mean, I don't, you know, no Florida laws, but usually when um, cases are, uh, we call it interstate compact um, cases, um, the child welfare agency in that state reaches out to us and will come out to your home um, to, you know, assess, um, you know, the situation and things like that to see, and we also can provide where you can become licensed. Um, right. As a foster parent. Right. So um, so maybe we need to talk more about that offline. Okay. I can give you a shout and um, I can send you an email or um, leave you a voicemail, but happy to discuss further. It's been two years, so we're really looking oh. for some support oh, or guidance okay. somewhere. <laughs> Okay, yes, and we can definitely um, provide you with what resources are available um, out there in the community. We have um, four kinship care coordinators throughout the state. We have one that's located in the Midlands um, that, you know, if you have any inquiries um, regarding um, kinship care, um, you know, they're able to provide you with what resources um, are out there. Um, we also have, we're working, we are collaborating with um, HALOs um, in the Low Country um, to provide, um, to build capacity to provide kinship care services statewide, um, kinship navigator services statewide, um, so that kinship caregivers, um, you know, can learn and access services. Um, and we also, um, this is, uh, uh, we are we're, collaborating with um, Dr. Kim Donha, who is Kindred Heart. Um, they have a support group, um, if you're interested as well, um, attending, um, that are held um, monthly. Um, they're held monthly. They meet the last Tuesdays of each month at 6.30. At 630. And I can also give you their contact information as well as a resource. So. 
there Thank are you. resources that are out there that's available for you. Thank you so much, Charlita. That mm-hmm. was great information. Um, this has been an informative discussion. That hour flew by, right? Like it, <laughs> it just flew right out of here. This has been an informative discussion, and we want to take a moment to thank all of our panelists for providing some really crucial information tonight and answering some tough questions. And again, we want to thank all of you for joining tonight. And I also wanted to remind everyone to connect with Richland Library's Social Work Department. Please call 803-386-8506. Once again, that's 803-386-8506. And leave a detailed message with your name and contact information if you have anything else you'd like to share tonight, if you have any questions that we did not address, and I know there are a few people still on the line that we weren't able to get to, please stay on the line after this call and leave a message, and we will return your call in the coming days. Also, we wanted to let you know a recording of this Teletown Hall meeting will be posted on richlandlibrary.com tomorrow, Wednesday, July 15th. So please consider sharing it with others. Thank you again. We hope you found this hour uh, fast but helpful. Uh, And this concludes our call. Stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you so much.